Oh, if your name is Emmanuel Ocho, a, bite, a piece of your ass has been uh, chewed up and spit out. Folk, they've been lighting this Fox Sports brother up after he made these comments following Angel Reese's news conference after they lost to Iowa. I'm sure y'all heard it. Press play. I'm about to give a gender neutral, racially indifferent take. Now, if you want to say, well, Acho, cater your take based upon gender. Acho, cater your take based upon race. I will understand that. But I'm about to give a gender neutral, racially indifferent take. Angel Reese, you can't be the big, big bad wolf, but mm. then kind of cry like Courage the Cowardly Dog. Mm. Because if you want to act grown, which she has, if you want to get paid like you grown, which you are, if you want to talk to grown folks like you grown, which you did post game when you told a coach for an opposing team, watch your mouth. If you want to tell people, get your money up, then post game when you take an L, you just got to take it on the chin. Nobody mourns when the villain catches an L. And Angel Reese, you have self-proclaimed to be the villain. Shout out to you because you are the second best basketball player on the court and it was not close. Outside of Caitlin Clark, it was you. 17 and 20, dog, showed up, biggest game, second biggest game of your career, absolute dog, but you can't under any circumstance go to the podium and now try to ask for individuals to give you sympathy. No one has sympathy for the villain. Mm -hmm. You painted the bullseye on your back. Why are you surprised when people shoot at you? Mm -hmm. So if you want to act grown, if you want to pose grown, if you want to talk grown, if you want to talk to grown folks grown, then you got to take the L like you grown. Because what frustrated me is when you want to be the villain, but you want to hope for sympathy like a hero. I'm about to give a gender neutral, racially and So, um, that was the commentary. Now, keep in mind, y'all, keep in mind that at the news conference after they lost to Iowa, somebody, a reporter, asked Angel Reese a question about the last year since LSU won the national championship. This is what she was talking about. I don't really get to stand up for myself. I mean, I have great teammates. I have a great support system. I got my hometown. I got my family that stands up for me. I don't really get to speak out on things just because I just try to ignore and I just try to stand strong. like. I've been through so much. I've seen so much. I've been attacked so many times. Death threats. I've been sexualized. I've been threatened. I've been so many things, and I've stood strong every single time. And I just try to stand strong for my teammates because I don't want them to see me down and, like, not be there for them. So I just want to always just know, like, I'm still a human, like, all this has happened since I won the national championship. And I said the other day, I haven't had peace since then. And it sucks, and, but I still wouldn't change. I wouldn't change anything. And I would still sit here and say, like, I'm unapologetically me. I'm going to always leave that mark and be who I am and stand on that. And hopefully the little girls that look up to me and hopefully I give them some type of inspiration that, you know, hopefully it's not this hard and all the things that come at you. But... Keep being who you are. Keep waking up every day. Keep mo being motivated. Staying who you are. Staying ten toes. Don't back down. And just be confident. I don't really get to stand up. That was what she was talking about. Well, uh, in the past few few hours, let's just say uh, Acho got a info and. Um, this was today's video. I just want to say a quick thank you um, to everyone who has respectfully uh, reprimanded me and uh, offered brilliant opinions on the Angel Reese conversation. I do not believe there is any one way to think about things, but thank you to the Ryan Clarks, the Essence Atkinses, the Bozma St. John's, um, the Trellas, the, the different individuals who is publicly and privately, um, just giving me good wisdom, good feedback, uh, good, good discernment. Um, I understand. I understand. I understand. I think life is all about understanding. 
And so I just want to applaud those publicly, you watching, and those privately who have respectfully, the operative word there being respectfully, who have respectfully reprimanded me. Matt Barnes, incredibly, incredibly, incredibly wise words. Um, so I thank all of you all for that. I do not stand on a hill saying that I am right and you are wrong. I simply stand on a place saying, hey, this is what I believe. What do you believe? Let's listen to one another and construct a collective belief. So love to everybody who's respectfully reprimanded me, and I appreciate it so, so, so very much. Thank you all for that. All right. So I just want to let y'all know something. Um, Roland is not a body language expert, but y'all can go ahead and show it. Let me explain something to you. Um, come on, show it. When you're talking and you're rubbing your neck. <laughs> yeah, y'all need, need to give me a two shot. Y'all need to put a two shot. <laughs> See, when you talking like this here, and you, uh, you come on, need two box. See, when you, when, when you, when you doing this here, uh, and then you, then you doing this here, you like, uh, I, 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 um. I appreciate y'all calling me. I I appreciate y'all getting in my ass privately. I appreciate y'all, you know, letting me know that my ignorant ass sounded like a damn fool. Um, I, 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 I really... Respectfully. Ooh, is, ooh, is, is it... Is it warm in here? Am I the only one? Is it? That's really what you just saw right there. For everybody watching right now, let me go ahead and give the cussing disclaimer uh, that's about to ensue. Because uh, I, I saw Reese earlier on Twitter. So, um, I'm, I'm, Lauren, I'm going to go ahead and start with you. Let me go ahead and, get, you know, because you, know, you also text me like, uh, are we Lauren was like, are we going to deal with this tonight? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll say this. There's a lot to unpack a little bit here. I mean, I get what he was trying to say. I do get what he was trying to say. I do think I'm a big Angel Reese fan. I think she's fantastic. And it's great to see women's basketball like blow up in the ratings and everything else. Uh, but the uh, I think what people were probably really sensitive to was the terms gender neutral as if, um, you know, there is no difference in criticism, I, you know, but, you know, women, women uh, athletes are coming into their own now. And I think people are now starting to have to make this adjustment. But after we saw the thing that happened in the L.A. Times. Right. Uh, and then we hear Angel Reese tell us that she's been getting death threats for a year, which the first thing that I thought about was, wow, isn't that interesting that we can get a 40 minute, 10,000 word piece in the Washington Post about Kim Mulkey, but we can't get one piece in the Washington Post about Angel Reese getting death threats for a year. That to me is an extremely serious thing, you know, and it's kind of like taken as, oh, no big deal, whatever. And, you know, I think about that with a lot of folks that are in the news, Fannie Willis getting up on the stand, telling everybody she's been getting death threats and everybody acts like this is normal, you know, business as usual. And it's not, it really isn't. And you do, at some point, have to attribute some of that to the gender of the people who are saying it. It's like nobody cares. Uh, but I do get some of his point, because I do think that, you know, didn't the women's movement tell us that we were equal to men and we could do whatever we want? And then when we get out there and do it and we get criticized, some of us get sensitive to that. So it's like if we're equal, we, we've got to be equal with the criticism. And frankly, the guys get criticized a lot. You know, Cam Newton, I can remember, Deion Sanders, you know, people who are black, who are very assertive out there, uh, it, particularly with sports, I think both men and women get criticized. I think it was just last week we saw a soccer player that plays for Brazil break down in tears because of the racism that he was dealing with. Right. And nobody talked about that. You but, didn't but, get the big outrage. You but, didn't but get here, the big thing that you get. But, I mean, here's, where you know? I, but here's where Acho screwed up. <laughs> no, no, okay. seriously. Where uh -huh. he's where he screwed up was 
is that he didn't understand context. What he did was he asserted that Angel Reese was crying because they lost. That's not what happened. She was literally asked a question. Also, let's factor this in. She announced a couple days later she was declaring for the WNBA. Um, I can tell you, I remember having a conversation with someone on the bus coming back from our award ceremony in 1991 at the National Association of Black Journalists. And it was my last night as a national student representative. And I remember shedding tears. And I remember this sister was like, why are you emotional? Because what I did for two years and how much I invested and what it meant uh, to me personally. So he screwed up by getting the context wrong. Well, he, I, Acho should have shut his mouth, though, the minute that he heard that she was getting death threats for a year. Let's stop on that one for a second. But, but, no, but that's, but that's why, my whole point. Getting, so he, 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 any, that's my why point. Was getting any, 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 why was she getting checked after that and after what we saw with the L.A. Times? But that's, but that's my point. So shut his mouth on that. So, so he got nailed. He got nailed. Yeah, I'm he got, I mean, look, it, it wasn't like, that, it wasn't like he, she came in and was crying because they lost the game. But here's the deal. Even if she cried after the loss, I've seen men, I've seen men cry after their last game. I've seen college players who go, there's no tomorrow. I've seen, I've seen guys cry on the court. You'll see them, you'll see them, they, they'll lift the jersey of their eyes because in that moment, they know that it's over and they may not be going to the NBA. And even if they go to the NBA, it doesn't matter. We saw the other night Steph Curry have on-court emotion when Draymond Green got kicked out of a game in the first four minutes. And here's the Golden State Warriors fighting for a last, that they're literally in the number 10 slot one game ahead of my Houston Rockets. In fact, they're playing right now. I just got the alert. And so Steph is sitting here going, dude, what are you doing? I'm 35 years old. I don't know how much longer I play. And Steph was emotional and where he kicked the chair and he put the jersey over his face. So, okay, the villain. So all of that, all of that, See that that's that why he sounded like a damn idiot. That villain thing, he sounded like a damn idiot on that villain thing because that's exactly what the dude at the L.A. Times did. I don't know why he wasn't paying any attention to that. But just to wrap it, I do think the point that, that he was trying to make about the gender-neutral criticism is that he's trying to say that the lady players should get criticized just like the men do or that if you're going to get out there and sort of be like the person who's always sort of asserting themselves in a certain way – you can expect some criticism. I think that's what he was trying to do I don't know what, I, I, frankly, but, frankly, I don't, know. frankly, okay, here's the deal. I don't know what the hell he was trying to do uh, because before I go to Reese, I don't know what the hell he was trying to say here when he was on Van Lathan's podcast <laughs> and he actually said this. <laughs> oh, when white people say, well, racism doesn't exist, I know why they say that because I've been in them rooms when they're saying that. When I kick it with black people and they're like, all white people are racist. Hmm. I know why you're saying that. All the while, I have the privilege and luxury of not having generational trauma because my parents were born in Nigeria. So, man, my method is oh, removing some of the sting um, because I don't have that sting and trying to deliver a message in a manner that people can receive it. Okay. Let me tell you why what you just said offends me. Okay. All right. You saying that you don't have generational trauma and you didn't mean it this way, but the reason, and, and it's, I have to name it, you saying that you don't have any generational trauma in some way meaning, or that in some way meaning that your delivery method to white people is going to be either more effective or more sanitized is to me dangerous. And let me tell you why. Everybody that you just named and what you're talking about does what they do in different ways. I don't think that any of the things that they do are necessarily harmful. 
But what I could say is a black man, a prominent one, acting as an emotional butler for white people and serving them the most milk toast, unspicy, unseasoned brand of racial discourse and accountability possible could definitely be harmful. Like we're fighting for our lives. And to me, having a conversation like that at that particular time, it's not that it's a different method. Everybody has a different method. Is that it's the wrong method. Is that it gives cover for Reese. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Is it my turn? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have to say, I, I thoroughly enjoyed, and somebody tagged me on that uh, apology video, his emphasis on respectful and respectfully <laughs> reprimanding him. And I have to say, fuck your respectful. Because I think that it is arrogant and ridiculous to expect, and this is a very normalized thing, that people expect deference to their feelings when they just shit it on a Black woman unprovoked. Okay, here you have a young black woman who has been subjected to death threats, who had AI porn, okay? That's what she meant when she said sexualized because they made fake porn of her through AI and she had to defend that and has been called a slave and all kind of racist insults. I mean, hell, let's throw Dr. Jill Biden there. She was going to invite the losing team because... She liked, you know, Caitlin Clark and, 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 and Angel Reese taunted her a little bit. Yeah, last year, you last a, year. That was last year. But I'm saying you've had a person who is literally tearfully pleading for her humanity. That was not a sports conversation. That was a human being talking about her humanity and just asking for people to treat her like a human being. And he missed all of that shit because he saw a chance to dunk on, punch down, and shit on a Black woman who lost. A Black woman who came to prominence because she was a champion, because of her style, because of her confidence, because of her bravado. And here's the first time where you get to say, aha, bitch, and you took it. And you tried to play the whole gender neutral and racially indifferent thing. Well, that's bullshit because that's exactly why people have the hot takes that they do. There are a lot of people that have confidence, that do the trash talk. That makes it entertaining. That's part of the reason why you're seeing record ticket, se record ticket sales for women's basketball and for and, and ratings. And that's part of the reason why you have, for the first time this year, women's basketball being able to even use March Madness branding. So it's bullshit to try to sit up there and disregard that and to attach words I understand it's a cartoon character like Courage the Cowardly Dog because she showed emotion. Well, which one is it? You don't want her to be the biggest, baddest bitch who is, you know, who's leaning into, and mind you, as a defense mechanism, leaning into the villain role because they're going to paint her with that no matter what. Anytime a black woman opens up her mouth, she's a villain, period. So, okay, maybe she leaned into it. She made someone off a good for her. I am mad at that. But that has nothing to do on court with what she was talking about in that interview. You don't hear Angel Reese out there, you know, having failing drug tests, fucking with people or anything like that. She has respect from her peers. Kayla Clark, the darling of, of, of white America at basketball, has expressed respect for her. So how did he miss all of that shit? How did he miss the moment? How did he miss the message? It's because it was a black woman who had the audacity to be confident, who had the audacity to, to affirm her own confidence and encourage other girls, not even specifically black girls, but other girls who look up to her to maintain their steadfastness in being confident. And so I applaud her. That's not cowardly. That's actually courageous. And you could be a champion and you win some and you lose some. But at the end of the day, we need to move forward with humanity. So I was one of those people that disrespectfully reprimanded him. And I will rhetorically stomp a hole in your ass every time people feel comfortable coming for and shitting on black women for doing nothing more than having the audacity to be unapologetically confident and excellent, period. I have a feeling where Greg is going to go, but I'm going to hold this. No, you, sh you should say it. You uh, should say it. No, 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 no. I, 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 I got something queued up, but I have a oh. feeling Greg is going to go there instead. But Greg, go right ahead. I don't know. I mean, look, 
everybody. This is why we have to have the Black Star Network. We can't have this conversation in white spaces. Uh, brother uh, Samuel Cho, Ebo brother, ask your mama and daddy about generational trauma. There's a little thing called the Biafran War in Nigeria. Ask your people, the Igbo people, because clearly you didn't learn it at home, and you damn sure didn't learn it at the University of Texas, Austin. That's probably why DEI is important. You should have took a black studies class there, or an African studies class. You know, Toyin Falola is the University of, uh, of Texas, Austin. He's an Igbo man. Uh, maybe you should ask your people about generational conflict when it comes to difference, because sometimes it can be black on black. Don't, don't get me started on that. So we can kind of put him to the side. But the reason, you know, the man, he rubbing his neck and stuff, he don't want to lose his job because everybody's come for him. And I think that this is the issue. This is the issue. Now, I've been a fan of the women's game since, you know, my girlfriend was a forward at Tennessee State for the Tiger Gyms, which is part of the problem. You know, HBCU women's teams used to have their own identities. They weren't lady anything. Now these Negroes have forgotten their history. Now they're the lady Tiger is the lady whatever. No, no. Tiger Bells, Tiger Gyms, Tiger Sharks, Sharks. And that speaks to the point. I've never been a fan of slave master politics and slave and, and uh, plantation athletics. You know, I'm from Tennessee. I was in New Orleans over the weekend for the National Association of Black Social Workers. And they love those black. They love Flage. They love Angel Reese till they lose. And at that point, the N-word throws free, freely like the Mississippi. <laughs> the point is this. Uh, you know, an old girl, the coach, Kim Mulkey, she dodged a bullet. <clears throat> she dodged a bullet. The L.A. Times did her a favor. Because I read that full like like y'all did, the full article in the Washington Post. And, you know, nobody who, you know, uh, Du Bois and Black Reconstruction would have called her probably the poor white, you know, the striver. But I'm, I, you know, I lived in Philly for 17 years, so I remember when John Cheney threatened to kick John Calipari's ass when he was coaching at UMass. And that's when uh, Marcus Camby and boys was up there. And John Cheney, whose boys were always in class, who practiced at 6 a.m. so they could never have an excuse for missing class. You know, that Don Staley mentality, Don Staley coming out of Dobbins High School in North Philly. You know, I'm not sure that any of Don Staley's uh, girls would be uh, in, in Sports Illustrated swimsuit. But again, this I'm, I'm having a, a, a serious conversation here. I'm, going, I'm coming to this point. This isn't a critique of Angel Reese. I'm looking at the coaches. I'm looking at the mentality. I'm looking at the uses and abuses of black people. I'm looking at the race war that is athletics. Because, see, I'm a fan of the women's game. I'm sure we all remember Don Imus, ancient dead ass, when he called Vivian Stringer's young ladies the nappy-headed hoes on the Rutgers team. This was the race war between Rutgers, between uh, Pat Summit and them at UT. Who, and, you know, uh, if you read the Washington Post article, you know Kim Mulkey worships Pat Summit. But then, so does Don Staley in many ways. But remember when the black women on the, the University of Tennessee team, and especially Rutgers team, was going up against the slave master in stores. That would be Gino, who always seems to find a couple of white girls to surround the sisters with. I'm sure for every uh, Maya Moore, you got a Paige Bucket, you got a Rebecca Lobo. In other words, you know, women's sports no different than men's sports in terms of race war. And what I'm saying is that anytime I see a person like Kim Mulkey Got all these sisters down there in the bayou in a racist as hell, Louisiana State, Baton Rouge. And then you basically don't care what they do as long as they help you win a championship. Shout out, of course, to Kim Mulkey, who ain't say a damn thing when the sister who got her a national championship was locked up in Russia Brittany because she's mad as hell. They mad her about the national anthem. Trust. That's a woman who would have the day. I don't even want to see where she might have the tattoo play because I don't need to see anything on Kim Mulkey's body. But I'm saying she did not take those players off because of the national anthem. She MAGA as it gets in many ways. The point I'm trying to make is when you get to this, Samuel Acho is, is look, man, you're not even a sideshow in this. You're not even a sideshow in this. What you have is young people. And, you know, I got all the world room in the world for young people. But you got young people in a space where these coaches in a plantation system, if they're not black women coaching them, and I'm very serious about this, they will engender this sense of anything goes that will have a sister from West Baltimore trash talking to white girl, because that's what she would do. And we all love it until it goes sideways. Were those tears because of the abuse? Absolutely. And you're right. She should, look, the minute you hear death threat, all bets are off. At the same time, of course, you are crying in part because you lost, because there's all this emotion there, because you want to beat these white girls. 
and you want to keep going. But you know what? When the national championship is played, the only thing that I see flawed about Dawn Staley in South Carolina is that I wish there was one more word added to her title. Head coach, South Carolina State. I swear, I wish these black players would go play for black coaches at HBCUs because once you go to these white schools and you up on these plantation system people, it becomes race war. And it's not gender. It's Shamika Holesclaw at UT and Candace Parker and them. It's, remember, UNLV under Tarkanian. Remember the U, University of Miami football team. In other words, it's always proxy waste war, and they love their Negroes until they lose. Samuel Acho, brother, you wandered out in the middle of a race war and caught a stray, and you need a little bit more history before you start saying you don't identify with generational trauma because, son, you, what you don't know is a lot. So I knew Greg was going to go there a few months ago. Oh, okay, you did know. No, 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 no I, I knew that because a few months ago, um, I actually came across this on Instagram. And you know what? Maybe Emmanuel Acho needs to watch this. The origin of Nigeria that shocked the hell out of me. Nigeria was never meant to be a country. It was something else entirely. In this video, I'm going to tell you what I discovered. Oh, and I want to acknowledge Burner Boy for bringing my attention to this in his song, Another Story, on his album, African Giants. Thank you for inspiring this video, and all of you let Burner Boy know that he got to me, and now I'm sharing this information with you. The creation of Nigeria was never about democracy, never about Christianity. It was about money, business, and profit. None of it for us. Pay attention. The area now known as Nigeria was called the Slave Coast up to 1870. This was the point at which the British had stopped slave trading and moved on to palm oil as their primary commodity out of Nigeria. One of the main suppliers of palm oil was the Benin Kingdom, and you have to watch my video on one of the greatest African kings most of you have never heard of. This is an important story for me personally because I'm from that region, so they are my people. And his fight with the British Empire over palm oil is one of the greatest stories of African colonial history. Anyway, everyone wanted palm oil and especially the British. A man called George Goldie set up the United African Company in 1879, which was then changed to the National African Company. He structured the palm oil business in the Niger Delta region, and by 1884, he had a monopoly that the British could exploit. So in 1886, Goldie violated the agreement he had made with the chiefs and moved his operations into River Niger and Benue. The company was also renamed to Royal Niger Company. Goldie tricked the chiefs into signing unfair trade deals, giving Goldie exclusive rights to export palm oil instead of what the chiefs thought would be free trade. These contracts were written in English, a language we didn't understand and based on laws that were not our own. This is similar to the land negotiations done with Native Americans in what is now known as the United States of America, where deals were done via contracts in English with laws that had nothing to do with the Native Americans. There was a meeting called the Berlin Conference in 1884 to 1885, set up by Germany's first chancellor, Otto van Bismarck. This was where colonial powers discussed how to carve up Africa and structure trade across the pieces of our continent they would take. We were not part of these conversations. The best way to think of this is like the NBA draft. Guys were out there making bids between lunch breaks and spa sessions. At this conference, the kingdom of Opobo was given to Britain. When King Jaja of Opobo tried to export his own palm oil, he was accused of obstructing commerce and then exiled. How crazy is that? And on his way home in 1891, he was poisoned with a cup of tea. Guys, I couldn't make this stuff up. The Jaja of Opobo story made other chiefs wary of their deals with the British. King Koko of Nembe Brass was one of them. He tried to take down the Royal Niger Company and attacked the company headquarters in Akasa by Elsa on January 29, 1895. King Koko captured 60 white men and lost 40 of his own soldiers. He used the 60 hostages to demand he be allowed free trade, the agreement he believed he had with the British company. They refused and he killed 40 of his hostages. The British Royal Navy retaliated by leveling the city of Brass completely on February 20th, 1895. King Coco went into exile and the British not only took control of the palm oil he once had, but also fined the people of his kingdom 500 pounds as well as confiscating their weapons.
Tragically, King Coco committed suicide in exile in 1898 after being branded an outlaw by the British company that had taken his kingdom, palm oil, and reputation. The Royal Niger Company sold its territory to the British government for £865,000 in the late 1800s. This territory was known as Nigeria. In 1914, the Southern Protectorate and Northern Protectorate was combined by Lord Lugard. And like that, the Royal Niger Company was rebranded as a country which would gain independence on October 1st, 1960. And Lugard is a street in Nigeria that still exists today. The Royal Niger Company changed its name to the Niger Company Limited, and it was then acquired by Unilever. Unilever still operates in Nigeria to this day. And that, my brothers and sisters, is how Nigeria came to be. We have a long way to go to fix the country, but we won't ever have a hope and a solution to our problems if we don't know how they started. What I told you in this video is just a small part of the foundations that led to unrest, civil war, economic instability, and so forth. Remember, it's not about asking anyone else to fix this or even wasting time blaming those we know caused and perpetuated it. This is about knowing our history. Nigeria was never a country we created. It was a company designed by colonizers for profit, and a lot of the infrastructure put in place for that siphoning of resources out of our land is still very much in place today. Crude oil simply replaced palm oil, and soon lithium may replace crude oil. Honestly, I feel angry not just for what happened to my ancestors, but for the fact that I wasn't taught about this in school in Nigeria, and that our children are not being taught about these things now. Every Nigerian should know everything about who we are and what we are up against. Subscribe for commentary on Africa, history, current affairs, politics, and the diaspora. See, this right here, Manuel Acho, is why what you said was beyond stupid. For you to sit here and say that, oh, unlike you African Americans, unlike you Black Americans, those of you of people of... Afri people who had uh, relatives who were enslaved of African descent, oh, I, I don't possess that generational trauma. So therefore, I can come here and I can talk to white people and I can talk to black people. No, your Nigerian ass has trauma. No question. Just like every other African who hails from the continent where they were colonized. You literally represent a part of Africa where the country never even existed. That's right. But then you sit here and sit your ass on Fox Sports that used to employ Jason Whitlock, and it's no surprise that Jason is on Twitter and he is sitting here uh, saying, oh, Emmanuel's correct and the rest of you are wrong. But see, this is the problem when you try to be one of the good ones. <laughs> See, this right. is the problem, Emmanuel, when you think that you somehow are set apart from the rest of us. When the fact of the matter is, you got lots of trauma coming out of the continent, and in fact, your trauma still persists. When you've got kidnappings of girls in Nigeria, when you've mm. got the United States, the reason we pay so much attention to Nigeria is because of your oil. But let's talk about the economics of the people in Nigeria. Look, I hope to visit one day. I'm told it's a beautiful country. I'm told that you have uh, exhibitions of significant wealth of those Africans who have money, those Nigerians there. But please, Emmanuel, don't you dare. And I was trying not to, but... <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not going to go ahead and cuss. I'm going to go ahead and keep it. I'm just going to Because I was about to cuss. But don't you dare release a video and talk about how I don't have the emotional trauma and how I can listen to white people and in the rooms what they say and that I can go listen to black people and what they say. Well, hell, Emmanuel. I've been in rooms where white folks said racism didn't exist. Hell, just the other day, some white woman uh, on Twitter uh, evoked Morgan Freeman when she said racism will stop if we just stop talking about it. Really? Tell, tell that to the black man who's on trial with a DUI tomorrow with a white woman uh, who poured the liquor out and then said she smelled marijuana. Tell that 
to the people who have been killed, which we talked about with Samuel Sengawe, uh, people who have been killed by cops. Tell that to the little black girl who was trying to sell some lemonade on the side and a white woman said, I'm going to call the cops on her because she was selling some lemonade. Tell that, please, to the brothers who tried to deliver FedEx and UPS packages just because the, uh, they were black, but the white folks got to call the cops on them because something was wrong. Tell that to the black man who had shots fired at him in Mississippi trying to deliver a package. Please, by all means, tell that to Walter Scott who was shot and killed mm. by a cop while he was running away. Tell that to please Kadarius, the brother who was run over by a cop in Mississippi. Please tell that to the police departments right now that are being looked at by the Department of Justice for the vicious beating of black people. Come on, bruh. No. What you try to do is let me just take out race and let me just take out gender. Well, that's the last thing you can actually do in a country where the original sin is race and where it was meant for women never to vote, never to own land, and their only job was to lay down and birth babies and cook in the mm. kitchen barefoot. And that's mm. who they hired. See, when you, hired. when you decide, Emmanuel, when you decide to sit here and say, oh, oh no, you're the villain. Really? That's not the villain. That's called somebody saying, I'm leading my team to victory. That's called somebody saying, I'm going to give it as good as I get it. Because, see, what's interesting is if I put Angel Reed side by side with Caitlin Clark, Caitlin, Caitlin Clark talked mad shit. You know what? I'm not bothered by that. Because do you know who was one of, one of the biggest trash talkers in NBA history? That white boy Larry Bird. And Larry Bird can back his shit up. You know you bad when you walk out to the NBA three-point contest with your shooting jacket on and you won't even take it off and you win the contest. Matter of fact, Larry Bird was so bad, when, they, when the coach put a black player on him, he said, this is some disrespectful shit. No, I'm sorry, when we put a white player, he said, he, he told the coach, this is disrespectful as hell. You putting a white boy, a white boy can't guard me. Yeah. That was Larry Bird. Michael Jordan talked a lot of trash, too. But see, I'm saying all of that because Caitlyn talked trash. Caitlyn was cussing on the court during the tournament. Her dad told her, shut the hell up and play. But you want to assign villain to the black girl. Just yeah, like the but... white writers assign thugs to South Carolina. Just exactly. like the LA Times writer did the exact same thing. Because exactly. the reality is, folk, white sports writers, and let's be honest, if you want to be honest, Emmanuel, you saw the LSU-Iowa contest the same way folks saw Duke versus UNLV. Of course. The same way they saw Notre Dame versus Miami, the convicts Absolutely. versus the Catholics. Absolutely. The reality is that's black versus white. We know exactly Absolutely. what that is. And so, Absolutely. brother, brother, why don't you actually spend a little more time with brothers and <laughs> sisters because the reality is if your ass can't even understand the generational trauma that exists in your homeland, you damn sure have mm. no clue, no concept of the reality that exists in sports in the mm. United States of their America. Mm. So I know you feel so blessed with the respectful, private phone calls you got. <laughs> I ain't got your number. I ain't never met you. But here's what I do know. You went to that little school in Austin. At a and we call it small U, small T. You a University of Texas graduate. I'm a Texas A&M graduate. But I'm going to end with this. You had so much to say about Angel Reese, but you ain't had a damn thing to say about the 60 people fired at the University of Texas uh, when it came to DEI. -E -D -E -E so why don't you, Emmanuel Acho, have the courage of Emmett Smith, who stood up and spoke out against what happened at Florida 
and called it like he saw it. Or maybe, just maybe, you're just going to stay quiet because you, Emmanuel Acho, you don't have that pain and you don't have that experience because you are so blessed to be able to sit among the whites and listen to them talk without them noticing your skin. They do because they notice your parents' skin and your grandparents and the other folk in the tribe where you came from and your homeland. Bruh, you are not one of them and they will remind your ass of that. Trust me, go ask Candace Owens who got her Negro wake up call. 